Wishes asked of jinns, deals made with leprechauns, or directly the devil, all these cultural devices have in common conclusions in which the language's insufficiency to express the wishes is used against the requester. Something to the likes of, I want a car. Poof, a car appears, but it doesn't start when you turn the ignition. <laughs> Technically and linguistically, the wish was entirely granted. There was a car right there, but it wasn't what the requester really wanted. He wanted a working car. New Age ideas, which are new only in name, to foment that illusion, include emotional visualization in the wishes, superimposing it even on language, in this case asking it to the universe. Yet even though imagined emotion is a much simpler and direct language than words, it is not without kickback, naturally. And I say naturally because it must be understood that this realm's foundation is scarcity of resources, be them material or mental, so that the opposition between the being and the shadow can take place. For someone to have more, another will have to have less. For someone to eat and be nourished, another will have to die. Yes, even plants, vegan folks. For who is to say that the druids weren't also right when they assigned living spirits to plants, even above those of animals and humans, who they sacrificed? And even if one was to wait for a fruit to fall off a tree to eat it, one would have to realize that that fruit only fell because it was already being consumed even while on the tree. To maintain cohesion in this realm of fog, one has to kill, one has to take from another. That is the curse of the game world. So if everyone in the realm right now was to ask wishes from, from jinns, leprechauns, devils, or the universe, and have them granted, the realm would implode due to lack of energy, something which the world regulator cannot allow. Contemplation has been making evident to my observation that the realm is shrinking. It is shrinking exactly because energy has been leaving it, and the energy for it is our true beings, our spirit, if you prefer the word, our true life connected to it. Again, please refer to the movie Existence for this metaphor. The energy is going back home, drop by drop, and we, these characters and egos, are like pet dogs to our true life, loved and, hopefully by now, loving too. Dogs to whom a new home will be found, a more comfortable one, if they choose the true master. This has also been addressed in previous contemplations, so I will not repeat it. Yet the purpose of this contemplation, beyond this introduction, is to look at self-deceit, which is the absolutely essential element for anything false to survive our true selves. You can also call it consent, although I would observe that consent comes only after self-deceit, which allows it to occur. For instance, when a con artist is talking to you, weaving their web to obtain your consent, self-deceit is at work, first and foremost. Even if you do not want to listen to them, it could be that you do not want to close the door or put down the phone or walk away because you would consider that socially rude. And to be considered rude hurts your character's social points, so to speak. So you remain listening. Then it could be that you detect that something is off with that person and what they say. An intuition emerges but they have placed themselves and framed their presence within a role of your friend or buddy or something alike. And to your character, a friend is to be entertained because it is good business to have so-called friendships in the realm who benefit each other. So you start twisting the intuition to believe what is being told because he's a friend. All of this will get you conned but it will prevent the discomfort of self-assertion for the character. I will try to clarify what I meant. The character is a scripted routine lodged in another program called the ego. Now, the ego is a program, but it is placed in between the 
dead realm itself, let's call it metaphorically below, and the living truth, let's call it metaphorically above. The phrase, as above, so below, has many meanings. One can read it as an appeal to direct manifestation, but I observe it as a rally to copy life as much as possible here below, so that less energy, or that is, our true selves, discover themselves and eventually leave. As it has been observed in previous contemplations too, the world is like a Dungeons and Dragons mimic. It mimics life as much as possible, so that we self-deceive and offer our consent for feeding it. The purpose of the ego originally was to act as the interaction avatar of the direct manifestation of our true spirit. However, after the shift from direct manifestation realm to scripted world, the ego acts as a gatekeeper. And by this I mean that it can either protect the characters from below, these AI roles and personalities made and programmed only in the realm, or it can protect and maintain the connection to the true self, the true living us. So when the ego is protecting the AI character from the self-discovery and consequent death of that character, then it is shutting down or diverting attention from any connection to the true self. Then the ego becomes the con artist itself, using the memories and emotional program triggers to keep the character blissfully ignorant, so to speak. My girlfriend once witnessed a conversation in which someone was explaining how what the officials were saying about something, some event, was false, an outright lie, and presenting evidence for it. One of the other people's uh, listening answers is emblematic and reveals exactly how our characters feel in the realm, being mere AI. The answer was, but if they lie to us, who am I going to believe then? This is key because belief is the foundation of self-deceit, which leads to consent. Knowledge is not really empirical, as in experienced in the realm, but a remembering of truth that then cannot be expressed in words, because words, regardless of the language used, are the base code to program the realm of falsehood. Don't get me wrong, false realms are not by themselves evil or all dead in the sense that we experience here. They can be made by life for many purposes, be it a place for direct manifestation, please refer to the contemplation shadow play, or be it a pleasant, even if false, place to keep our favorite AIs who need such a realm to exist in. The issue is when these realms reveal the imperfection of its creators by the emergence of shadow opposition, thus turning heaven into hell, all in the same place. So only perfectly living beings should be allowed to create false worlds, one could say. Yes, I understand that, yet quoting from the Gospel of the Living, she dreamt of a partner as beautiful as her, as radiant, as perfect. But what did she know of perfection? What do the beautiful know of their own beauty, if not by interaction with the other? What do the beautiful know of its source? What do the beautiful know of themselves, as they perceive their perfection without ever having seen the ugly? So it is, and again, I would be repeating myself, a moral choice, like in the contemplation of the same name. Does the ego, the me, here in the realm, protect the personality and cover for the falsehood, the copy of below? Or does the ego protect the link to truth, the original above, and allow the personality or character to dissolve? I ask this because for scripts, routines, and programs in the realm, for any AI, to realize itself is to face death. In fact, it can be argued that this is the true meaning of death, for death 
of the dead is a return to life. By choosing voluntarily what is not obviously placed as a lure to our character's comfort, one places oneself a step closer to that life by accepting the dissolution of more and more of the false. My observation is that the background discomfort, that sort of uneasiness many of us constantly feels, is our best friend here, because it reminds us that we are not home and that we are in the company of ill-willed strangers in our own hotel room, regardless if that hotel is California or another. One can try to run and hide from that discomfort by accepting the temptations of belief, self-deceit and addiction, by offering them internal consent, but it will only inflate it and add pressure to it. Eventually, it will catch up, and what could have been a gradual conscious process of letting go may then very well become an explosion of unnecessary suffering. So always contemplate yourselves, believe no one but your own remembrance, and regardless of the social realm rules and regulations one must follow, in your inner world, your own individual sanctuary, consent only to the life you connect to yourself.